Hello and welcome to Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. I'm Dusty. And I'm Mike. And today's Trail Mix is about drones in the national parks. Okay, so in the space of Instagram content about public lands, Mm -hmm. you really can't avoid photos taken by drones. Or video. Or video taken by drones. Right. It's like a thing that has basically kind of like exponentially grown with the advancement and the sales and growth of drones itself. As we were seeing a lot of these photos go by, I did in the back of my mind go, um, I think NPS is like pretty hard and fast on their rule about drones, but I wasn't sure. So we did all the research (laughs) and dug it all up. And we wanted to find out. We could and give it to you today. Today, today. So let's talk about drones. Let's drone about drones for a moment. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. So, Mike, what is your relationship to drones? Um, Honestly, it's really, really small. I have a friend that's a little bit of a techie. He's someone that is really into computers and kind of just like new emerging technologies. And he had bought a very small drone a number of years ago, which I think we were both together when he let us both fly it for the first time or when he had flown it for the first time. So that's kind of like the experience that I've had. I feel like that brought me back to a time when I had flown someone's model aircraft as a child and it did not go so well. So I think I was a little panicked about it. I see. I had some um, memories flood back into my mind. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my experience with drones is limited to only that experience flying right. your friend's yeah. drone. Right. That's really yeah. about it. I, do, I mean, I see them in Sam's Club right. sometimes. Yeah, I do have a... There was a teacher at my school who taught photography and video, and he used drones a ton in his work. And he did some beautiful things with drone photography and drone video. And, you know, being at some events or venues like the See Here Now Festival in Asbury, that's places there where I've seen drones flying. But I feel like... Typically, in the waking world that I live in, I'm not seeing drones all that often out there. But I mean, we're not seeing We're not them. seeing It's true. I mean, but the mm-hmm. big brother is always watching. No. <laughs> Ain't she? She is big sister. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Let's give a quick rundown of the history of what they call unmanned aerial vehicles. Right. So, right. yeah, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, which, P.S., I think we need some more inclusive language here. Unpersoned aerial vehicles. Right. Unpersoned aerial vehicles. Plenty of women and non-binary people fly drones. It's true. So originally, if we want to really go back in the way, 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 way back machine, um, drones actually date all the way back to 1849, where Austrians attack the Italian city of Venice by um, loading unmanned balloons with explosives, oh, you know, well, for a fun go. celebratory time. And this is the first time that you have this unpersoned vehicle being used for warfare. And a lot of the times that history of drones really dates back to a history of warfare. Um, in 1915, the British military used aerial photography to help with um, a battle in World War I, which showed the German trench fortifications. During the First World War, the U.S. was also looking to create pilotless aircraft. Eventually, this technology just keeps advancing. In World War II, we have the first remote-controlled aircraft called the radio plane OQ-2, and that was the first mass-produced product in the U.S. that was a breakthrough in manufacturing for drones in the military. In the 1980s, they start to become more advanced, Obviously, this is a technology that is fruitful when it comes to warfare or strategy. As time goes on, we start to get more into the recreational field of things as we get into the 90s and the 2000s. And And that is essentially what we are talking about today, is recreational drone usage. There is a ton of drone usage commercially. Right. And around 2007, I guess, drones started to become, the drones were smaller and we were trying as a society to figure out what to do with them and right. how to interact with them and if laws need to be created mm-hmm. around them. But if something is flying in the air through airspace, then suddenly we have to have laws about them. Right. So for a long time, because drones were new Mm -hmm. and because they were strange and they we hadn't figured them out yet right 
in a um, recreational sense in a recreational sense but also like it they weren't really used in a commercial sense yet fully. right i'm just saying separately from military purposes sure, like I'm, that yeah. obviously had their own rules they, and regs there right. yeah as with anything that's like new and we're still trying to figure out mm-hmm. until we can figure it out we kind of like to just like say oh no this isn't allowed at all until we can right. make some decisions about it or figure yeah, it out first ask questions later <laughs> <laughs> thanks so, america <laughs> we ended up in a situation where we essentially didn't have any commercial drone laws right and then we also and therefore didn't have any recreational drone laws right so it took a little while but finally we do have some official rules from the faa which is the federal aviation administration and what are those rules right so here's a number of rules um that are part of the recreational drone flying usage in the u.s so you need to register your drone and mark the outside with the registration number and carry that proof of registration with you Um, you're only supposed to fly for recreational purposes um, and follow the safety guidelines of a community-based organization drones need to be flown at a level below 400 feet when in an uncontrolled or class G airspace. That's where the FAA is not controlling manned aircraft. Can't fly in controlled airspace at all. Um, That's around and above many airports unless you receive some sort of authorization to that controlled airspace through the low altitude authorization and notification capability or you are flying a recreational flyer a fixed site that has a written agreement with the FAA. You have to keep your drone within your line of sight, which is just a good rule of thumb anyway. Do not fly in airspace where flight is prohibited, obviously. Um, Never fly near other aircraft, especially near airports. Never fly over groups of people, public events, or stadiums full of people. Um, Never fly near emergencies, such as any sort of accident response, law enforcement activities, or firefighting. And just like with everything in life never fly under the influence of drugs or alcohol and this is specifically for recreational drone use right there are different policies for commercial drone use right but today we are talking about recreational drone use yeah there are some really great apps that can help you if you want to know if where you are is safe to fly your drone so you can literally like pull up the app it'll show you exactly where you are and it'll show you if you are in a drone safe Mm -hmm. area for recreational flying and big sister will know you where you're at too right (laughs) right well big sister always knows where we are (laughs) yeah right okay so now let's talk about the um national park service and their relationship with drones okay what have you found that really spurred the drone laws um, into being for the national park system? Well, there are a few incidents. The national park service had to do something because there were a few incidents with drones that made them go, okay, we need to figure out a policy here. Right. Now they created their policy in 2014 and the policy they created was a blanket, no recreational drone usage policy. It is applied to all national parks, all land that is operated by the national parks, which include rivers, seashores, historical parks, hiking trails, biking trails. And anything else that's NPS managed. Okay, so this story of a man named Raphael Perker, who was a Swiss commercial drone pilot, actually brings the National Park Service and the laws regarding commercial drone usage together in the same place. So in 2007, the FAA banned all commercial drone usage, largely because at that time they did not know how to regulate them. Right. In 2011, there was a, there was a Swiss commercial drone pilot named Raphael Perker, who was flying his drone in the Grand Canyon. And it was a small styrofoam drone that he was flying. But Rangers stopped him and they took the memory card from his drone and they issued him a $325 ticket. And it was on the grounds of it violating a federal code that prohibits, quote, delivery or retrieving a person or object by parachute, helicopter, or other airborne means, except in emergencies involving public safety or serious property loss or pursuant to the terms and conditions of a permit. Now, 
this law does not specifically include drones and isn't specifically about drones. Right. But it's all they had to throw at him. It's at the all time. they had to throw at, the, at him at the time. Right. Right. And so here we have the situation that finally like opens up this sort of gap in legislation regarding drones. A few years later, he was working as the commercial drone pilot, which at the time was illegal. Mm-hmm. And he was flying and taking like aerial shots of the University of Virginia. Mm-hmm. And the FAA found out about it and they fined him $10,000. So Damn. he sued them and yeah. took them to court and essentially like revealed that prior to the FAA putting the commercial drone ban in place, they did not have any public hearings about it. Mm-hmm. And because of that, he won the case. Right. They threw out the case. They yeah. threw out the ca- But this also led the judge to saying there's no ban on commercial drone usage right. now. So that sort of like opened up the door for commercial drone usage. And it all started because, you know, his styrofoam drone was right. taken from him at mm-hmm. Grand Canyon. And at the time, no, I don't blame those uh, park rangers for um, handling that situation like that. No, I don't think that that was an inappropriate response, um, especially since it was like literally the Wild West of drone usage and right. like anything goes. So I think they were just trying to be regulatory and keep the national park safe and preserved for future generations, which is the mission of the NPS. Is the mission of the NPS. Now, this happened in 2011. NPS issued its ban on drones in 2014. Mm -hmm. So there was a full three years between this incident with Raphael Perker at Grand Canyon Mm -hmm. and the official ban that was put into place. Right. Now, there are other incidents that happened in this three-year span. Like in 2013, when a drone landed on Lincoln's head at Mount Rushmore. Um, Obviously, this is, you know, it's a problem. We're talking about landing on NPS site, first of all, and something that is a a memorial to these presidents. So not a great thing there. In 2014, a drone was seen separating juvenile bighorn sheep from adults at a, in a herd at Zion National Park. And now, the reason that this that's is a problem. A, it is yeah. a problem because this is the reason why that's a big deal is because um, little baby bighorn sheep who are separated from their parents can die very easily. Right. And so now we have the drone interfering yeah, there's, with animals. There's cause for that, for and sure. their habitats. Mm-hmm. In June of 2014, a man posted a drone video on YouTube at Denali National Park. People from the park said that it was interfering with, uh, or it just was disrupting a local bird population. Right. Also in 2014, later in the summer in August, um, someone, a, a Dutch tourist, crashed a drone into the Grand Prismatic Spring geyser at Yellowstone National Park. Now, this set off a lot of alarm bells um, for many reasons, obviously. That drone was never recovered. They weren't sure what that impact of that drone would do to the prismatic spring or those thermal waters that were there or the chemical balance of it, for that matter. And the tourist was fined $3,200. Do you know what that made me think of? What? It made me think of that time that you threw that bottle of suntan (laughs) lotion into Vernal Falls and just let it go just the dragging of yourself (laughs) continues (laughs) holding a mirror up to yourself (laughs) right and looking at what you did also we didn't throw a bottle of suntan lotion (laughs) into the water if you never listened to that episode no it was an accident that that is episode two (laughs) making us sound like litterers so now that the ban is in place and it is still in place Mm -hmm. the consequences for like going rogue with your drone is a fine up to five thousand dollars right. and or six months in prison. Right. That and or it always gets you. And or. <laughs> right. So um, however, yeah. there are um however we have good news. And that is that there are some ways in which drones can be flown in national parks. Right. Now they can never be flown recreationally. One can never just say like, you know what? I feel like going to fly my drone over in Yosemite today. <laughs> Let me go do it. Yeah. That is illegal. Right. That's how you get a $5,000 fine and or six months in prison. Or. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But there are ways that drones can fly 
in the national parks. In order to do this, you must have written permission from the superintendent of the park. So that is something that is important to note. Um, Some reasons why uh, this has happened in the past. Um, So for example, in the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon maintains a team or fleet of drones that is used specifically for search and rescue. They actually have a whole program and people are enrolled in the program to like study how to use drones for search and rescue. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also um, the Marsh Billings National Historic Park, which is in Vermont. Drones were used there specifically to create a visual map for visitors visiting the park. So it allowed the drone operator to take photographs of the park to give a better visual representation of what people could hike and see while they were there. And similarly, they did a thing like this in Great Sand Dunes mm-hmm. National Park of Colorado. Right, where they were able to study like the dunes themselves and how the dunes moved because there is a lot of interesting shifting sands, literally, that happen there in, in Great Sand Dunes. So typically, it seems like most of the time it's for scientific research or if you are doing search and rescue operations, there's also been instances where if you're trying to do fire management, that drones have been used in a positive light um, in the national parks. And I don't think that either of us are coming to this with necessarily negative feelings about drones. I don't think that they are inherently bad by any means. I don't know what your thoughts are. You can tell me in just a second. But um, I, th- I do think that if they're used in the right way, then they can be good tools. But they're a tool, so just like any other tool, they can be used negatively as well. In the national parks, it's your responsibility to be a visitor in that space. You are coming into that space to enjoy the space, to leave no trace, and to not disrupt any of the wildlife, um, whether that's flora or fauna that's there. And so NPS is deemed that drones impact that negatively and so that's why there is a ban so in national parks i you know i am perfectly a-okay with there being no drone usage whatsoever but i think if you're a smart person and you're interested in really enjoying recreational drone use and you want to do it for your betterment and for your enjoyment as long as you're doing it safely properly and to the law then have at it yeah also there are so many other places there are so many natural spaces where you can fly a drone um state parks yeah i mean not every state park no but but you there are do you have to look yeah it is a matter of you Mm -hmm. doing the research right and i feel like responsible drone usage responsible recreational drone usage means researching where you will go to fly your drone I have no negative feelings about drones. Yeah. They're definitely a new frontier for mm-hmm. all of us. Right. However, our public lands have spoken. Right. And they say, no, we don't want drones interfering with our animals, our plants, or our habitats yeah. here. So and we in, can't use them yeah. here. And until the machines rise and take us all over, we, we just have, have to, to follow the laws that humans have made. We've got to follow the laws. <laughs> That's right. Let's end this trail mix with a game. Great. So speaking of the machines rising and killing us all, Uh I figured it would be a fun game to play an extra round of Jeopardy about fun robots that we've seen in television and movies. Great. So this is a five question Jeopardy just for you, Dusty Ballard. Oh, you are so kind. And for the viewers out there. And it's not even my birthday. (laughs) It's not. For 100. This clanking gay metallic duo proved that love does last through nine separate film iterations, even if one is an uptight prude and the other is a know-it-all who speaks gibberish. They somehow make it last. This is, without a doubt, R2-D2 and C-3PO. Did you say r gay t 2 I believe you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're C-3-P-mo. right. C-3PMO. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I think we figured out our Halloween costumes. I think we did. <laughs> Great. Um, Okay, for 200. You can't talk about a future robotic uprising without talking about this robot daddy who traveled through time, attempted to change the future, and did so all while wearing a leather daddy jacket the entire time. Oh, was this um, Arnold Schwarzenegger? And who is the robot, And he was... The Terminator. That's correct. (laughs) All right, for 300. These bots had machine gun breastplates, all the right moves, and they even counted Britney Spears among their ranks in this SNL alum's spy-based comedy films. Oh, I have no idea. What are fembots? 
Oh, mm mm. By no. Dr. Evil. Nope. Yes. Nope. Mm-hmm. Didn't remember. No. You didn't. Okay. For 400. This barrel chested, mustachioed, proper military robot was one of the only things standing between this fantasy realm and its baddie king from becoming completely human. Too bad you had to wind up his thought, action, and speech all the time, or he would have been the perfect automaton companion. And you know this. And if you don't, I'm going to smack you. Okay. Yeah, it's not RoboCop. No. Is it TikTok? It is TikTok. From Return to Oz. I would have been really mad if you didn't get that. Mm-hmm. I would have thrown my phone at you. <laughs> I know you would have. <laughs> All right. And last but not least, don't cry, even though I totally did. When this mechanical man made a final attempt to save the boy and by extension his family in town when flying to confront the missile headed straight towards the town he was residing in. Talk about a higher emotional functioning from a piece of scrap metal who can put himself back together in the end. Oh, is this an animated movie? It is an animated movie. Is it, hold on, is it Big Hero 6? It's not, but that's a great one that made me cry too. Oh, what is that? (laughs) It's The Iron Giant. Oh, The Iron Giant. The Iron Giant is a great film. Oh, I haven't seen it. You've I, never seen The Iron Giant? But now I know what yeah, happens. Sorry. It's okay. Jennifer Aniston is a voice of the mom. Then I'll definitely watch. There you go. <laughs> This has been Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. And we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often, and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. For more images from our episodes, follow our Instagram at Gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at Gaze at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks we talk about on this show, visit our website gaze at the national parks.com that's gaze g-a-z-e all original artwork featured on our website and on instagram is by michael ryan all original music is by dave seaman and performed by dave seaman mariella Klinger, and sean sclios our music producer is skylar fortgang this episode was edited by dustin ballard <laughs>